Hello, I am Krista West of Avlia Folk Embroidery, and this is the May Floss Tube. I'm just going to tell you right now, it's really early in the morning here. Um, I've got a friend's kids staying with me for a few days, so I kind of needed to get up before all the hustle and bustle of three little girls, getting three little girls off to school happened. And so I may be a little slower. There may be pauses. So anyways, for those of you who are first joining me, I'm Krista West. I'm the designer and owner of Avalia Folk Embroidery. Uh, the website is www.avliaembroidery.com. It'll be in the description. And you can find me on Instagram at Krista M. West, also in the description. And you clearly found me here on YouTube. Yay. So I've actually been kind of active on Instagram um, the last couple of weeks. We've just had a lot going on in the workshop. And so I've got some really great posts, new releases, the new needle minders, which I cannot wait to share with you in a moment. Um, lots of stuff. Uh, Pam, I did, a, I did a fun reel yesterday. Pamela, my workshop assistant and friend and neighbor. Um, how great is that? She literally walks, she literally lives across the street from me. So Pamela just walks across the street to work every day. Um, Oh, there are just no words. There are no words for how grateful I am to have Pamela right now. Um, she's just so like perfect for working in a textile biz because she has done sewing and she's done handcraft and she understands kind of the whole world and she's just got great ideas and like the needle minders came in and had i thought about how we were going to ex exactly like package them up for shipping why no i had not and so pamela like had that all organized and like put together and it's just been great um i was actually i was actually pretty nervous about having somebody else in my workspace um i talk to myself all the time while i work um and just you know i'd never had anybody in my space like that and it has just been probably one of the very best things that's ever happened to me. I feel like I'm getting a life again. I feel like, um, which is not bad, love textiles, but working 10 to 12 hours a day, year in, year out, it takes a toll. And so I feel like at this point, I was just getting to that point where I felt, um, I wouldn't say burned out because I love textiles. It's not like they had lost their meaning for me or anything, just plain tired. <laughs> and so Pamela's come in and those hours that she's working every day are hours that I'm not having to like wind floss and make kits and do things. And it's just been incredible. It's just sort of re-energized me. And I feel like it's, I actually also feel like, um, if I can be really honest for a minute, I feel like it's really helped me value my own creativity. You know, I grew up in an age where like nobody wanted their kid to grow up and be an artist, you know, like, hello, that was like, probably one of the worst things you could do for your family. And I didn't even know you could actually have a job in textiles until I was in my 20s. So for me, I've always felt like I have to do the work, the work, the work, the work, the work. And then like, if I do all the work, then I get to be creative. And Pamela has really kind of rewritten that narrative for me. And she's really helping me. Um, she's just so supportive. And she's like, you go, like, go do your thing, design, go do the stuff that only you can do. And I'm like, Okay, great. I'll go do those things. So it's been really great. Anyways, um, so those are all the places you can find me. And that's our little digression about Pamela. So let's get into some embroidery and what's going on at Avlia. Well, it's been so busy the last couple of weeks in particular because we just launched the new needle minders. I'll talk about those in a minute. That was a that's actually been a process that's been in process for almost six months. So that's kind of exciting to have that all come to fruition, but it's been a long time in the making. And then I had a number of people turn in pomegranate collection patterns. Wow. Can't wait to show you those. And then, um, what else has been going on? Oh, here's some fun stuff that you do. You probably want to know about. Let me grab a sip of coffee. It is early here. I've recently gotten into coffee. Don't know why. I was kind of a tea drinker forever and ever. And I don't know. I just really got into coffee a couple weeks ago. So anyways. Okay. So housekeeping notes. The first thing I am really excited to share with you. So excited. Is that we have a new loyalty program on the Avlia website. I think I've mentioned it in previous floss tubes. But my website is hosted by Wix. And for many years, um, 
my my actual my tailoring website was all HTML coded, which I'm really almost embarrassed to say. So I only got on the content management system bandwagon, a CMS. It's basically where somebody else like does all the back end work of your website. It's magic. If you've ever had to do things in HTML code, um, HTML code is like a thousand pages of knitting patterns for your website, if you can kind of think of it that way. And it's lengthy and it's complicated. And Wix just saved my life. Um, about four or five years ago, I switched my websites over to Wix and I love it. And that isn't like a plug for Wix. Like I'm not getting paid for any of that. I really just love Wix. Um, and then about a year and a half ago, they just out of the blue assigned me an account representative, uh, Nathan. Nathan has been terrific because Nathan is like in his late twenties and he's a skier in Colorado. He is about as far away from the embroidery world as you can possibly get. And that has been really helpful perspective for me because I know the embroidery world. I know people who stitch, but Nathan is somebody looking at it from the outside. And it's just, I really, really value his perspective. And he's introduced me to a bunch of like fun things to have on a website. Um, we can thank Nathan for the courtyard, the forum that's on the Avlia website. It's basically like a mini internal Facebook without ads on the Avlia website. And that's where people can post and, and show off what they're doing. Right now, there's a whole bunch of you like talking about your, um, your favorite needlework tools, which I just think is so incredibly cool. And then I drop in every couple of weeks and do a notes from the workshop blog post where I basically talk you know, in text about everything I'm working on. Because you know, some people love video, some people love text. There's lots of different ways to share content. Anyways, and a couple of weeks ago, Nathan said, hey, you need a loyalty program. And I'm like, wait, like one of those things where like you spend a dollar and you get a point kind of a things. And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, sign me up. Because for the longest time, I've wanted to have a way to thank the people that are, there are a lot of you out there that are clearly choosing to support the Avalia website. And what can I say? You guys like almost make me tear up because it's just so exciting to me to have people that are that supportive of my work and my designs. Um, okay, I am actually tearing up because it's just incredible. And so, but I wanted a way to sort of thank you guys. So there's this new loyalty program. So basically you sign up as a member, that's free, it's not a big deal. And then every point that you spend, you get um, a, a little point reward and it'll, it'll just automatically be in your, in your account I'm still learning the system myself, as you can tell. And then when you hit 150 points, then you get a coupon for 10% off a purchase. And then when you hit 500 points, you get um, a 20% off coupon. So that's a way that you can use that to like, you know, kind of plan your stitching, stock up, that kind of a thing. So I'm really excited about that. So the loyalty program, that's the first thing that's kind of big at the website right now. Um, the second thing is the courtyard. More and more people are finding the courtyard and that's been very exciting, including, it's been amazing to me to see, we have this very wide uh, skill set of stitchers that are posting and sharing and interacting on the courtyard at the Avlio website. I've got super experienced stitchers who are like basically drawn thread hem geeks, Cindy Russell. I'll show you her stuff in just a minute here. She just turned in a great pomegranate collection piece. And then um, also brand new stitchers are posting. And I just can't believe it because I get like a daily log of all the activity. So I see what's going on so I can monitor, I'm the moderator. So anyways, it's so exciting to see people who have literally, it's their very first cross stitch piece. They've never done anything and they're posting. And then all the experienced stitchers are weighing in and being like, good job, great job. Your stitches are so even. And that kind of support when you're starting out like a new hobby is invaluable. And I feel like we're building this incredible resource space at the courtyard of really engaged stitchers. And I just love it. It's funny, I was thinking about this the other day and I was thinking about the world of embroidery um, and thinking about how really embroidery is all about sharing. If we can have sort of a Mr. Rogers moment here. Um, see, I'm even wearing Oh, what's going off? Oh, my phone. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay, there's my phone alarms going off. See, because with the three kids in the house, literally I have like 10 alarms all day long. Where to get somebody? They are going to three different schools. So it's a little crazy. Anyways, good crazy. Love having the noise of kids in the house. It's just a great noise. So anyways, what was I talking about? The courtyard. Um, let me think. Let me get catch that train of thought. Um, 
it's gone, but that's okay. So the courtyard. So um, that's just what I'm so excited to see is how many of the new stitch. Oh, I know what I was going to say is embroidery is all about sharing. I've been really thinking about this a lot lately because, um, you know, I take patterns that are hundreds of years old and I reinterpret them and get inspired by them. And maybe I'll take a tiny corner of them or maybe I'll do a whole pattern. And my goal is to like share that out. People who embroider are like sharing. And I've never met a more generous group of people than stitchers. And it's just interesting to me, you know, having worked like in the, you know, having owned a business for almost 30 years now, you kind of can tell a lot about a person about sort of where they stand with generosity. Let's put it that way. And my very favorite people to work with are the people who are really just generous with their time and their information and all of that. And I'm so amazed. And it, it just sort of hit me all of a sudden this last week that embroidery really self-selects, stitching self-selects for that kind of person. So, you know, like, welcome to the club. We're pretty awesome. Anyways, enough of like all this nattering on. Then I'm going to start sharing you embroidery. Oh, one more thing. Go. It's like, can I finally like get to the embroidery? Yes, I can. This Sunday, I'm going to actually be giving a virtual lecture for the EGA, for the Embroiderers Guild of America. I think it's for their archives. It's a, I, and I believe registration may be closed, but you can look for it on their website. It's actually not going to be on folk embroidery. They've asked me to speak about my work as an ecclesiastical tailor for Greek Orthodox churches. And for those of you who are wondering, yes, I still am making investments for Greek churches. So that's why it's been great to have Pamela and get a little help in the website because I am still doing a lot of investment work for churches. I have seamstresses that help me out. Um, but I still am doing all the cut and fit work and all the measurements and helping clients with their choices and all of that. So it's a lot of work, a lot of good work though, a lot of really colorful work. But so that's the lecture I'm going to be giving on Sunday um, at the EGA. And what a lovely group. They were great. They did a whole like tech consult meeting with me and their four tech ladies were great. It was just great. So I think it's going to be a really great lecture. It's going to be with slides um, of photos of my work over the years. So it's both informative and historical and a smidge of a retrospective. So it should be really fun. Now, enough of all that. Let's get to embroidery. So the first thing I want to show you today is Cindy Russell's Riga Diamonds. Can we just have a moment? Look at this baby. So this was a pomegranate collection design that I put up. It actually, the original design was from one of my, the original design is like kind of just a little snippet on in black and white in one of the inside covers of one of my vintage Latvian needlework booklets. And I was just really taken with the design. There was a couple of things I really liked about it, um, but it was just like black and white. I think the original would have been worked like just in, in red, um, possibly red and maybe black, but I just could really see how you had these double bands. You basically had, let me see, I don't wanna like, okay. So let me try it this way. So you basically had these like blue bands here that by doing those in a little bit darker, more subdued color, these diamonds in the center sort of look like they're sitting on the top of it. And then you have this like secondary motif of the diamonds. I don't know. I just loved it. And then my original design on the pomegranate collection, I'm going to show you a close up here of the outer border because we're going to talk about two things on this. This outer border that is actually five rows of cross stitches, which if you can look at really gives the design kind of a restful frame for the, this very, very visually stunning design to sort of sit within. That design, that border on the outside originally was one row of each of the colors. And Cindy changed it. And as soon as I saw it, I thought, oh yeah, that's a good change because it was a little bit more energetic. It had a little bit more of um, Greek folk embroidery is oftentimes finished with like one row of each of the colors used. Not, well, I wouldn't say often, but a lot. It's, you see it a lot. And so that was kind of my, my wheelhouse. That was where I went to with that border. But when she did it in this like masked border of deep turquoise, I was like, oh yes, please. So that's the first thing. And she also, I had it designed it as a cushion cover, as like a square, and she worked it as a table runner. It's just fabulous. It is a lot of stitches. This will be our largest kit to date. Uh, it's over 40,000 stitches. So if you're looking for something to really sink your teeth into, um, like price per stitch, this is a really good value. Uh, she worked it on Legacy Satemo Linen. We are going to offer it 
on our vanilla 30 count linen, I believe. Hers is a 32 count. Um, I've got to actually look at that. We may, turns out a couple of the Greek linens, unbeknownst to me, I had ordered 30 count and what I got in um, the porcelain in the parch, the new parchment color was actually 32 count. Um, and actually it was kind of a happy accident because I've been thinking about adding a 32 count and I wanted to start working on some 32 count. And so now I can. Um, so anyways, so I'm not really sure what fabric we're going to offer this on, uh, but it'll probably be on either the porcelain or the vanilla. But what I really want to show you is Cindy's drawn thread. Cindy is a master of drawn thread hemming. Now, let me, you know what I'm going to do? Hang on. I'm going to get this against, let's see, something. Yeah, there we go. Dark. Look at that gorgeous drawn thread hem and notice that it's got a P hole drawn thread hem stitch here. And then it's got a beautiful drawn thread here. Cindy has actually really kindly given me this amazing PDF of all of her experience and knowledge on drawn thread hemming, which instantly made me think, oh, wow, why did I actually put a drawn thread hem video on the internet when I clearly did not even know what I was doing? Um, because she's a master of drawn thread hem. And I'm going to be using that information to do more with drawn thread hem because I just think it's amazing. And Cindy taught me an interesting trick when she did this. She actually sent it to me. I don't know where it is. It's somewhere in the workshop. She actually creates a little doodle cloth on the side with a little scrap fabric when she's working a design and she tries out different hem finishes to see what she likes before she works it on the piece, which I thought was a really, really clever idea. Many of you are used to the idea of a doodle cloth. It's basically, for those of you who aren't, it's basically like a little cloth that you keep next to you that you can like try out stitches, try out colors, that kind of a thing before you put it on your finished work. Anyways, so that's Riga Diamonds. That's going to be coming out real soon. Okay, next up on Pomegranate Collection is Astra. So a shout out, and this is going to be just one of the many pieces that I show you today that are not finished yet. I have this huge backlog of finishing going on right now that's a little exciting and a little overwhelming. Um, but this one is really cool. This is Astra. Many of you guys saw, have seen this and gotten it as a pomegranate collection download. And now we've got it as a full runner. This is work in these very lovely, warm, muted Mediterranean shades. This is, if I remember right, I can't remember. I think it's, yeah, it's 918 copper, 924 gray, green, very dark, 469 avocado, and 832 golden olive. So a really rich palette, beautiful all over design, awesome like primary motif with secondary motif in a trellis. I love trellis designs like this. They're just things that like, I know I just love the idea of like motifs within motifs within motifs. Give me more motifs. So I'm gonna be working on doing the drawn thread hem on this one. And then we'll be able to release this one, which is exciting. Um, I could just totally see this like on an entryway table or a coffee table. You could even turn this into a rectangular like bolster cushion cover, which would be really cool too. So that's Astra. And thank you, Avalyn, who stitched that. Anyways, I have to like literally pin the cards with your addresses on them because we're getting a lot of you sending in pomegranate collection stuff, which is wow. It, I just wasn't expecting that. And it's been really exciting. It does mean we're releasing a lot. So like, don't get overwhelmed. Um, part of the reason I am releasing a lot is that my long-term goal with Avlia is for it to become like this real warehouse or encyclopedia of folk embroidery. Um, not to overwhelm you, but so that we can really kind of see a lot of folk embroidery through the ages, like in one convenient location. Anyways. Okay. So that's Astra. That's that one. What should we talk about next? Oh, the newest release is... Cycladian Scrolls. This finally released. I talked about this in the last Foss tube, so this will be quick. And I got awesome photos. Oh my gosh, the light was perfect. I was so happy with these photos. You can tell I'm getting better at the photo editing. Yay me. That has not come easy, but I'm getting there. And boy, there's some great photos of this. This is the first kit stitched on our new 26 count McKinney. This is the Ivory 26 count McKinney. I'm trying to get it close enough to the camera so you can really kind of get a feel for it. If you go to the website and, and there's the tab that says more and on that more tab is the loyalty program. If you click on that, we use the photo of this right there. So if you want to see a really good close up, you can see it right there. Um, this stuff is really fun to stitch on. It's, it looks more ornate. Like 
you wouldn't really look at this and go, wow, that's a 26 count fabric. Um, for those of you who have eyesight issues, boy, this is like everything you love about counted thread without the eye strain. So that's pretty great. And it's got this really unique drape. It's much drapier. So if you can see that, it's got drape to it, which linen doesn't really have as much of. I mean, linen has a drape, but it's a very different drape. It, it definitely is more structural. And this is really soft and really drapey, um, which is great. I'm working another design in it, which I'll, oh, I know, I'll talk about new stuff now. How about that? Um, let's see, what are we gonna talk about? Okay, there's like a lot. So. Uh, let me get a sip of coffee and then we will talk about some more new stuff. Um, okay, well, before we launch into the new stuff, I do want to give a plug for the new needle miters. So the new, okay, so let me give you a little bit of backstory. Um, in Byzantine art, there are, I'm going to show you one of my favorite reference books. In Byzantine art, I'm going to see if I can hold this. There are a lot of decorative motifs used all over and they're used in illuminated manuscripts and one of the other places you see them is in churches in greece when the walls or the ceiling are covered in iconography they almost always put these borders all these decorative borders all around the icons it's very distinctive it i just love it i'm trying to find some more of them so this is some of them so there's all of these, like, I'm trying to find the border borders. Hang on, here we go. All of these really gorgeous, lavish, intricate borders, okay? So I have always loved these. And this book has, like, thousands of them. And But there's all these, like, little teeny tiny elements. So these borders are made up of, like, okay, there's a little teeny tiny element. And then here's a little teeny tiny one. And then here's, like, one that's a really cool little design. And I've just been really drawn to these for years. And so about six months ago, um, I was surprised to see that needle minders were selling. I, I didn't even use needle minders before I started off Leah. I didn't even know about them. And Susan Fitzgerald of Stitch Modern sent me one and, and I had ordered some stuff from her and she sent it to me. And I was like, oh, oh, this is handy. And I started using them for, not just for my needle. I tend to prefer them to roll up my fabric and hold my fabric in place around my Q-snap. That's in my Instagram reel. And it was in my stories yesterday, I think, um, because people were asking. And I just was like, okay, wait, I need a bunch of these. Like I need one to hold my pattern to my Lowry work stand and I need one to hold my fabric and I need one to hold my needle. So I'm like, okay. And I had the Avlio ones and they started really selling. And I could understand now like, oh, I get it. Like this is, this is actually a really useful tool. And I started looking at different needle minders and realizing that there was a lot of like really cute needle minders. There was a lot of whimsical needle minders. Um, there were just all the, but there wasn't a lot of like, can I just say unashamedly beautiful needle minders? <laughs> and I was like, I really want something like really beautiful. Something that almost feels like jewelry for my hoop something that almost feels like estate jewelry i i have like a penchant for estate jewelry um not a huge budget for it but i have a real penchant for estate jewelry and usually when i buy jewelry i only buy estate jewelry um i wait many years and i save up and i buy like one or two few pieces because i just love um i love kind of the art history of old jewelry and i wanted something like that so I was flipping through that book like last fall and I'm like, oh my word, these little tiny decorative motifs would be amazing as needle minders. So that's what I did. So every one of these is from some sort of like hand-drawn border that would have been like in around an icon or in an illuminated manuscript or used as some sort of decorative element in Byzantium. So here's the first one. I'm gonna go one by one because they're just so cool. So the first one is pumpkin seed. The pumpkin seed motif actually is seen throughout a lot of textile history. If you start looking for it, you'll see it. Sorry, I'm trying to get the light to where the light, they're really shiny. Um, you'll actually, the very first place I uh, encountered it in my younger days was in Amish quilting. There's the pumpkin seed design that you can quilt. Um, but then you see it all over because it's this like cruciform shape, it's rounded. So it looks like a cross, it looks like a flower. It's just beautiful. So that's the pumpkin seed design. And this one has like really cool little starbursts. And I did this one on like a beautiful, like 
it's almost like the 924, like the tealy royal blue, that kind of, um, it's not blue green, it's definitely blue, but it's like that, got that little bit green undertone. Love it. Okay, the next one I did is Byzantine Rose. I have to think of all their names. Byzantine Rose. I know you look at this and go, it's a heart. But in Byzantine art, this shape was actually called a rose because it's a midsection of a rose. If you take a rose and cut it in half, this is the shape you get. So that one, and it's got a really beautiful flower in it. Let me see if I can show you that one right there. Okay. Then the next one I did was Byzantine Tulip. I love this little design. This has got what's called, okay, so this one's done on a coral background, kind of a soft coral background. And it's got these really cool tulips. And but what I love about this one too is it has what's called a pearled border. When you have a fabric that has those round, the circles and then the little tiny dots in it, that's called a pearled border in like art history. Geeks call it that. So next time you look at something like that, you can like go to your friends and go like, oh, that's a pearled border. And you can like look so, you know, that. Anyways, but um, they were actually those sorts of circle designs were actually considered to be apotropaic symbols, which means they ward off evil in the ancient world, which is kind of a cool little art history fun fact. Okay, um, this one, this one, boy, this one took us like a bunch of work. This is the Justina one, and it can go either like this way, or you can kind of like turn it like this way. It's kind of like, it's like a, it's like a flower and a cross like overimposed. Um, the cruciform shape is just used a lot in Byzantine art. Um, they discovered probably a million ways to adapt the cross shape and make it decorative. And so this is just one of them. And I just love the red and blue. This was actually a larger design, but it was so intricate. We actually had to take only the teeny, teeny, tiny separate amount. So this needle minder in the original like decorative art is literally like a half an inch across. So this one's kind of really, this one's really neat. I really love this one. Love the red and blue. It plays really well with the gold. The knot work one, is getting a lot of love from all of you. This is a teeny tiny, I don't know if you can even see it right there. You, the close-ups on the, on the website are really good, but it's a beautiful knotwork design. Knotwork was really popular in Byzantium. It isn't just Celtic. And much of Byzantine illuminated manuscript and decorative art features very elaborate knotwork. You'd look at it and think, that looks Celtic, but no, actually Byzantines use knotwork just as much as the Celts did in their art. And so this one is, and this one's really neat too. This one was also really challenging. The um, factory that I worked with was like, oh, we're not sure. I'm like, please, please, please try because this one's going to be amazing. And they did. So sure enough. And it has got green and light blue and red. So this one's really neat. And then we have the, um, we're down to just two more. This is Rodora. This is this fabulous, like sort of art deco-y design that's kind of like a little pomegranate. Um, and so we call that one Rodora. And then the last one, and it's on like a rich garnet background. Then the last one is Daphne. Sorry, the magnets like move around on the cards. Daphne is really cool. It's a classic laurel leaf design. And it's got this beautiful, the green, you know, the camera um, doesn't really show how beautiful the green is. The green is really beautiful. It's definitely more of a celadon. It is not a mint green. It's like a, like a really lovely soft celadon. So anyway, so there's that. And then um, as Kristen and I, my, Kristen is my graphic designer who's worked with me from uh, really pretty much the very beginning. She's what makes Avlia look pretty. Um, I mean, I can stitch, but she does our graphic design and literally I'd be completely lost without her. But we were doing these designs and I'm like, wait a second, as long as we're, um, sorry, that's crinkly. As long as we're doing the, the needle minders, why don't we make coordinating floss, floss organizers? And so we did. And so basically all the designs, every pack of floss organizers, it's 18 of them in a pack, and it includes three of the six designs. It has all the designs, but the Justina design. We, when these went to press, we hadn't finished working out the bugs on Justina, so that's why these don't have them. And for those of you who've never used them, the floss organizers, this goes on a binder clip here. You just get a little like binder ring. I don't ship the binder ring with them because that would add, it, it would put us over the half an inch shipping limit to keep the shipping down, which helps me keep the price down. Um, and then you basically put your floss through here. You basically kind of double your floss in half, pop it through there, and then, I can't remember what that's called. Then you, you hook it. Somebody asked me to do that on a reel, so I'll do that on a reel probably today. Um, well, actually, maybe not today. I'm actually gonna be painting the bathroom today. That's another story. So floss 
floss organizers. And in our efforts to continue moving towards um, eco-friendly packaging, they will come in a little glassine bag. Okay, so many of you have probably already noticed that, that your kits are starting to come in glassine um, because we are slowly switching over to that. And actually, it's been, it's been such a positive reception. I'm thrilled because these glassine bags, pop them in your paper recycling, curbside paper recycling when you're done with it. And the sticker too. So, yay hoo. Okay, now let's move on to some other stuff because in just a few minutes, I'm going to have to go and like corral children and make lunches and get everybody off to school. So, the last few things I want to talk to you about are really exciting. So um, those Byzantine designs that I was talking about with the needle minders, I just went down the rabbit hole of Byzantine decorative motifs a couple of months ago. And so I've created a new Byzantine band sampler. I think I might have shown this in the last floss tube. But what I've done with this is so it's worked in the kind of the classic um, soft blue, terracotta red and black of Byzantine decorative art. Not that all Byzantine decorative art is done that way, but this red is sort of a classic feature of Byzantine art. So I've done this and it is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's 10 borders plus the outer border. So this I'm going to actually finish. You can tell it's one of the things that's not finished. I'm going to finish it. I'm going to frame it so that the, and take a picture of it that way so that those of you who want to see it framed can see that. And then I'll take it out and then I'll turn it into a wall hanging so that you can see both ways of finishing it because I actually personally want this. I have a spot upstairs in my house where I want this as a wall hanging um, rather than a framed piece. So I like kind of the textile immediacy of a wall hanging and how there's like no glass or anything. I like the way they kind of feel old, like when people in Roman homes hung, you know, like had draperies and things like that on their wall. So I'm just a fan of wall hangings. Anyways, so that's the piece. But here's the other thing I'm doing with this is several of you, well, not several of you, many of you actually, um, were uh, have emailed me or messaged me about our old bit bags. So for a while there, oh, where's, hang on, let me see if I can grab my bag. Hang, just give me one second. Whoa. There we go. Okay. So when I first started out of Leah, one of the things we offered was these little bit bags. They're little bags little drawstring bags, but they're done with a construction technique I learned in Greece where you take a long strip of fabric and you, embroider, you, you embroider, and then you, you basically make a, you sew the lining to it, turn it inside out, and then you fold it in half upon itself. It's, it's a cool technique. And so I'm, and, and so it's a totally lined bag, little drawstring top. So this is actually one of our old designs. This is my glasses case. And they're handy for like your glasses or your pencils or your tools. So I'm reworking this with new instructions, kind of new everything to release them. And what I'm doing is I'm taking a couple of the Byzantine borders out of the, out of the great big piece. Hang on here. Let me see if I can do this. I don't have enough hands, right? I'm taking these and I'm going to turn these into different projects and smalls projects, sort of to give people an idea of what you can do with a band sampler. So this one is gonna become my new eyeglass case because I actually, that one's getting kind of tired and you know, why not? I really liked this design and I felt like it looked so good vertically. So I'll make this into a new eyeglass case and that way I can like make a video and explain how to do that. And then this one, I was like, well, I don't need two eyeglass cases, but this one, what I'm really imagining and I'm trying to kind of figure out, I'm thinking I might turn this into a little pattern portfolio piece that I can use because I always have my paper patterns with me because I'm making notes and I'm sketching and I'm doing finishing ideas. And I end up with my my little work table next to my place that I stitch. It looks like a mess all the time and I don't like it. So I'm thinking, wait, what if I had some beautiful little embroidered pattern portfolio that I could like slip all my papers in as I'm working and then I would have something beautiful to look at while I work. So that's the goal here. That'll take me a bit. I really need to get through. I've got some big projects going on that I need to get through. And then I'm going to sit down and have like a great big day of like finishing and all the things. It's so much finishing. If it was just like me finishing stuff, it'd go really quickly. But I want to make sure that I like take videos and that I take photos and document because um, one of the really big surprises to me about Avlia is that it hadn't occurred to me when I started Avlia that my tailoring and sewing knowledge would be helpful. I know you're probably sitting there going, Krista, really? I'm like, yeah, it just didn't. I was like, embroidery was over here and like sewing was over here in my mind. And then I realized, oh wait, like I know lots and lots of like sewing and professional construction techniques and things that we can bring to embroidery to like you make embroidery useful. Because you know, in the in the folk embroidery world, embroidery was was decorative, 
but it was useful too. It was like cushions. It was bed curtains for privacy and warmth. It was on folk costumes. It was like all of these things. So anyways, um, okay, so that's how I'm going to be doing that. What else am I going to show? Oh, I know the other thing I have to finish. Really exciting. Okay, so I can't remember if it was last floss tube, couple of floss tubes. I talked about my little Byzantine Beast series that of, and I floated around the idea of doing a quiet book because that's how I wanted to finish it for my little granddaughter, Miriam. And so I have finished the sample stitching on that and I'm getting ready to put it together. And this is one that I'm definitely like doing. So let me, let me show it to you. So it's all out of order because it, these are the pages of the book. And so there's eight motifs. They're so cute. There's butterflies, a peacock, two birds, a parrot, two dogs, because Miriam loves dogs. And then there's a little family of ducks. They're so cute. And then a horse, and then a uh, mama deer and a baby deer. And these are all out. These are all from folk embroidery. And so this is all set up for me to basically take the pages, and these will create a quiet book it's going to be constructed, for those of you who have made a needle book before, it's going to be constructed a lot like a needle book. And, but I had to sort of figure out the whole layout. And so, for example, each page will have its coordinating matching pair. So, for example, the toucan, you can see his border is here. The matching border is down here on the deer. And then, like, the horse and the birds will be on the same page. So, the, the borders will line up once I have it all sewn up. Believe me, it took a lot of, like, sketching and planning and all that stuff. But I've got it. And so, I'll be finishing that up. And then when we do that as a kit, there'll be instructions for like how to, we're going to actually do this pattern in two varieties that are going to come. I think I can manage to get them in the same pattern. And the pattern will be, it'll actually be a really great pattern because you'll have eight little designs of little cute folk embroidery inspired animals that you can use however you want. And I'll show instructions for how to set it up for the quiet book. And then I also just did it in a wall hanging orientation. So that if you wanted to make a wall hanging for either a child's room or just somebody who's an animal lover, you just love these little motifs because they're just so charming. They're so sweet and charming. Um, then you can do that. And I'm going to put all of that in the pattern because I really, I really want the pattern to be like meaty and like have a lot of ways you can use these motifs. So that's going to be coming out. I don't know when. I'm not even going to promise that one because this one's going to take a lot of finishing because of doing, I've got to do a mock-up first so that I can double check that the way I think of finishing it in my mind is actually going to work. Then I'm going to do a video so that that one, it's very clear how to make the book. Um, the one thing that will not come in the kit is the fabric for the cover. And I gave a lot of thought to that and I thought about including fabric, but then I thought if you're making this as a quiet book for a child you know and love, Use cool fabric that you have in your stash. Use fabric that has meaning to you. And I had a little piece of Liberty of London fabric in my stash that I actually, like my work bag is made out of it. Yeah, you can see. Yeah, okay, wow, work bag, very loved and used and faded, um, actual Liberty of London. So I thought that was really cool. I'm gonna actually make her needle book cover out of the same fabric that like my embroidery work bag that I use every day is out of. So you wanna give some thought to that, like. Find fabric that's really meaningful to you. So after that, okay, we've got that. Oh, I know the next thing. Um, this is coming up really soon is Bit Kit Grapevine. And I'm gonna show this to you in two orientations. Just give me a couple minutes more. Okay, great. I'll be done in a couple minutes, okay? Yeah, so kids are up and need wrangling. So anyways, um, okay. So the Bit Kit Grapevine, I had a shop, Rabbit Row Yarns in upstate New York, ask me, she's in the wine growing region of New York, and she's like, could you make a kit that has like grapevines in it? And I'm like, oh, oh, that's a great idea. So this is a kind of a grapevine design. I, I took a vintage design, but I really, really messed around with it because I didn't like the way the grapes were and I just wanted to mess with it. So this is going to be a new Bit Kit coming out in June. June, we're going to release two bit kits. It's going to be this one because I was kind of thinking June, summer stitching, little projects for travel, all that kind of stuff. So June is going to be the grapevine, which actually is kind of like you can go either way with it. I tried to, it's got like, oh, ha, huh, isn't that hilarious? I just happened to notice, oh my gosh, did I photograph it this way? Look at that. Did anybody else notice this? I forgot to embroider the extra set of leaves here. Oh, wow. How about if I do that? How about if I get those on there? Oh my gosh, I think I photographed it in everything that way. 
I'll go back and see if you can even notice it in the photographs because I didn't notice it till just now. Ha! Huh? Is that a riot? Okay, so I'll go back and photograph those or uh, stitch those. How about we do that? But, um, so I had people, at, and then and then I was like, wait, that's a really great idea to have something with grapevines that you could use as a border because you could easily take this and make it into a table runner or something like that. So grapevine coming out. Then the other one that'll be coming out is the Bit Kit Athenian Sunflower, which is so cute. I don't have the sample to show you because it's at Just Cross Stitch Magazine being photographed. Um, it will actually debut in Just Cross Stitch Magazine in their August issue, which releases in June, but I'll be able to start offering kits in June. So let's see here. What else do I have? Oh, I have one more thing to show you, actually two more things, and then, I, then we'll wrap it up. The first is, I have to show you this amazing um, vintage embroidery I found on eBay. Oh my word, I love this thing. Look at, okay, I've got to see if I can get back and show it to you. Okay, can you see it? I'm going to like talk through it around. Look at that. It's on McKinney. It's on a fine count of McKinney. I'm guessing it might be a 30 or 32 count. And actually, I believe this fabric is not called McKinney. I believe this fabric is really sheer. I think it's called Elvetsia in Greek. I've seen it before. But look at this motif. Isn't this just fabulous? And it's not like a huge amount of stitching for a really, really amazing design. It's really simple. It's got, I'm gonna get close, a lot of outlining, great colors. So I'm gonna definitely be adapting this as a square design. And I think what I'll do when I do it is I'll make it like the size of like say blue larkspur or something like that. But as you can see, this border would be really, really easy to just repeat more times and just make it as big as you want because this is just, beautiful. It's such a beautiful cloth. I like the colors. It's just beautiful. So that's one that I found. And then the next one, I can't remember if I've shown you this, but I was also able to find this gorgeous Bulgarian piece. And I'm really starting to explore Bulgarian work. It's got a, it's got, it's like, it's Greek embroidered with a twist. It's really cool. And so, and it tends, they tend to use a lot of really shiny threads, which are not my go-to. So I'm really curious to kind of work some of these patterns up and look at them and see like what they look like. Like for example, I'm noted like this little motif here. I wanna see what some of these things look like when they're worked not shiny. And this one's worked all in satin stitch. And that's kind of next up for me. A lot of folk embroidery has satin stitch, which is like over one thread. And it allows you a lot more um, flexibility with the design. You can get more intricate designs. So I'm trying to figure out like how to chart that and do that because I think that would be really cool. And then the last thing I'm gonna to talk to you about, last thing, and then we're gonna wrap it up. This is exciting and it kind of like saved, well, not the best, but one of the best things right now for last. So about a month ago, um, I got an email from this company in Britain named Appleton's. Now, because you all know that like, I'm still such a newbie, I had never heard of Appleton's cruel wools. I'm guessing a lot of you have, those of you who are more experienced, but I've never done cruel work, which is wool, it's wool floss essentially, for those who don't know what it is. When we make floss out of wool, we call it cruel or tapestry wools. But Appleton's reached out to me and they said, hey, we think your designs would be amazing worked in cruel wools. And I'm just like, whoa, whoa, is that a thing? Like, can you do that? Is that allowed? Um, and so I was like, because, okay, one thing that you may not know about me is I adore wool. I just have had a, I love wool. I've loved wool for years. Um, I have worked on um, high-end tailoring wools for years as I make cassocks and things like that. I like only wear wool sweaters. Um, I just love wool. And I have wool blankets on all of my beds. I'm a huge fan of Pendleton Wool, which is like our Pacific Northwest. It's an institution here. It's one of, I think, only two woolen mills left in the United States. So when you say wool, I'm like, I'm listening. Here I am. So then if that wasn't great enough, they were sort of like, oh, by the way, we're the company that created the first cruel wools for William Morris. Can we have a moment? Okay, if you've not been following for very long, then I just have to catch you up. I am a huge fan of William Morris and the arts and crafts movement. It actually was my very first textile artistic inspiration when I was 19 years old and a friend of mine uh, artist friend of mine introduced me to the arts and craft world and I literally thought my mind was going to explode. And I've been in love with arts and crafts work ever since. Uh, William Morris's textiles, the wallpapers, all of these things. 
And so, but then imagine my surprise um, last fall when I'm doing research and I actually find a scholarly article on how William Morris and the arts and craft, the early founders of the arts and craft movement were, it, were partially influenced by attending a museum exhibition of Greek folk embroidery. <sighs> really? It's amazing. I mean, sorry, I'm a textile nerd. So that just like blew my mind up. And I'm like, okay, because there is this very sort of medieval Byzantine sort of feel to a lot of arts and crafts, um, woodwork and it's just arts and crafts aesthetics overall have a very, they echo Byzantium. There's definitely echoes you can, you can kind of visually hear there. And so when Appleton's was like, and then I went and they were like, by the way, were the people who created wools for William Morris. I'm like, yes, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, please, please, please. They sent me samples and this is a revelation. And then I thought, okay, so then my next thought was, oh, I must be the last person who's like come to this party. Clearly there is a cross-stitch and cruel party going on and I'm like the last person to show up. Nope, not the case. A few people have like worked stuff in wool, but I got together with the EGA tech team when they were doing their tech check for my lecture and I, there was four women there who were all experienced stitchers. I'm like, so you guys have all like done cross-stitch with cruel work? They're like, no, no, we've never heard of that. Is that possible? And I'm like, oh, yes. So here's the deal. I'm starting to work a sample and I am loving it. Couple of caveats. You have to work with shorter lengths of the wool because it wants to kind of untwist. So you can't work with super long lengths, but it's not a really big deal. Um, I thought it was gonna be harder to thread the needle. It is not, I'm not finding that much trouble, but if you do, you can get one of those little fish needle hook things. Look on Amazon, they're like a fish needle threader thing. You'll see them, you'll know what they are. Um, so sometimes if I have a little trouble, I just use one of those. But here's what I love about, and I wouldn't work wool on like say 32 count. I'm not even sure I would work it on 30 count, but here's the deal. Worked on 26 count McAnee, you get this amazing carpet effect. And I'm just thinking cushion covers, like stuff that you would actually wanna sit and like snuggle up into, yes please. So I'm reworking, this is the old Santorini stars pattern, um, which wasn't great when I first released it. I was new and I wasn't, it was a bad colorway and the outer border was icky. Anyways, um, so I needed to rework it. I shouldn't say icky, but it just wasn't all that it could be. Let's say that. And so I'm reworking it in these wools. It is gorgeous. So let me show you some of these wool. I mean, they are just so gorgeous. Look at those. They are just these incredible, rich, saturated colors. They're sending me more samples so that we can offer kits in Appleton's wools. So that'll probably be happening by the fall. I'm guessing we'll have enough samples stitched and have our inventory in, but I will be able to offer not just DMC floss, but I will also have the wool option for people who want that, which I'm really excited. I don't know if we'll offer it for every kit. Um, well, I don't see why not, but we'll probably have a number of kits that we release right off the bat that are basically just that just come with the Appleton's wool and that we I will put a DMC conversion chart so that if you don't want to work with the wool you've got the same DMC colors that's what I'm working with, with Appleton's right now is to figure out which of the Appleton's colors most closely harmonize with my DMC flosses that I use all the time so anyways that was a really big day sorry guys it's um I've got to go make lunches and wrangle children but um thank you so much for joining me happy stitching and I hope you have a beautiful and sunny May.